Welcome to In a Nutshell, where we talk about something juicier than food, and that is the lives of my foodie friends. This is the joint initiative of Asian Culinary Exchange and the Asia Society Philippines. Today, we talk to three people who have successfully set up Filipino restaurants outside the Philippines. First, we have Will Mahusai, who is joining us from Australia. He is running the operations for the Sydney Cebu Lechon, a roast pig joint his parents started back in 1991. Their humble diner in Newton has now been recognized multiple times by the likes of Time Out and Good Food Magazine. Let's say hi to Will. Hi, g'day. How are you guys going? Hope you guys are all well. Next is American-Korean chef Christina Sune, who has been popularizing Filipino food in Argentina since 2005. In her 25-seater restaurant, Cantina Sune, in the Palermo neighborhood of Buenos Aires, she has been luring crowds with her adobo bao, seafood kare kare, and sinigam soured with pineapple. Please welcome Christina, who joins us from Argentina. Hola, como están? Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, we have Charles Olalia, who is the chef and co-owner of the modern Filipino restaurant and cocktail bar, Mam Sir. Before opening his own place, he worked at restaurant Guy Savoy in Las Vegas, a two-star Michelin French restaurant at Caesar's Palace, and at the prestigious Fre French Laundry. Thanks for joining us today, Charles. He is in sunny LA. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. So for, for everyone's information, um, may I ask you to please introduce the concept behind each of your restaurants first? Well, I have uh, three restaurants at the moment in, in Argentina. I have two and, and I opened one in Manila recently. In, in the Palermo neighborhood in Buenos Aires, I opened a Cantina Cine, or a lot of people call it just Cine. Well, we started with South and Asian food, but predominantly Filipino cuisine. Uh, because of my family and my mom's uh, cooking, and that's what I like to do. And I also opened up a tapas bar, a uh, Asian tapas bar that's called Apunena, named after my Kapampanga grandmother. So it's a beautiful concept. Um, it's more of Asian cuisine, but everything has a base of Filipino cuisine. No, but you're Korean American by blood. How, how did you get introduced to Filipino cuisine? Yeah, um, my biological mother is Korean, but um, my parents separated and my father remarried and he re remarried uh, my mom, who was Filipino, and that's who I was raised by. And we moved to the Philippines as soon as they got married. She's, she's the one that raised me since I was a, a little girl. And I grew, I grew up, I spent the big part of my childhood in the Philippines, in Anto the city. My, my home food was Filipino food, and uh, my upbringing was Filipino. So, although me, my bloodline may not be Filipino, I'm definitely Filipino by heart. <laughs> now, well, aside from lechon, of course, you offer lechon because that's all just in the name, right? What else do you serve in your restaurant, and how was it formed? I have uh, just our um, staples, which is the silog um, meals which is available all day. We've got, we serve Pinak Bed, we serve um, Sibu Lechon Manok, and we serve Lechon Kowale and Bicol Express, and Pancit on, a, on um, like maybe once a month on the specials board. But yeah, it's a very short menu. But how did your restaurant start? My parents started back in 1991 as a catering company. And last year I decided to open up a restaurant, uh, February 2019, because I thought that um, if we could get maybe like a Cebuano sort of theme restaurant in Sydney, uh, it would do well. And actually, yeah, it did well um, because I'd say nine out of ten restaurants here are all mainly sort of Kapangpangan style and there was no Cebuano viands representation. So, yeah. Oh, Charles, what's the concept brand done with? Love the name, man. Thank you. Mamster is... Uh kind of a, a culmination of all my experiences here in LA and you know I was born and raised in the Philippines so to me I always had this I always felt like I had a very different unique outlook on on the cuisine and on the culture I really wanted to showcase um, the, the modern the sexy the the style of say Makati or, and uh, the architecture and, and the vibe of of the parties that we used to go to growing up, you know, um, 
because I always felt that the food here in LA, it's always, it's already there. You know, like a lot of, there's a lot of Filipino restaurants. There's a lot of knowledge about it. But I feel like the design of the restaurant was the next step forward. So for me, to be able to put it up on Sunset Boulevard, I'm not playing on the ethnic playground anymore. We're playing in the, the mainstream conversation. So that's that that's what Mamser is. It's really um, presenting a Filipino restaurant in in the modern in a modern light. Um, can you give us an idea by by citing some of your dishes? Since we're in Los Angeles, there's a lot of uh, sea urchin here. So the lumpe that we do, we do a shrimp mousse with that we blend with a sea urchin um, that we wrap with fruit de brick, and then we top it off with Santa Barbara sea urchin. Um, that's probably like the one spinoff that I do. Um, and a lot of and a lot of the other things that I do is very much close to home. For example, the the longanisa that I learned from my uncle, we we make burgers with that at the restaurant. Um, we do the street style like as as close to home as it is. Pancit Pancit Canton, Pancit Palabok, um, Sinigang, Kare Kare. The menu changes quite often. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of use the seasonality of LA and I kind of play into the dishes of what we normally eat in the Philippines. A good example of that is when it's fall season here. Um, that's when that's the only time I serve dinner go on, you know, so it kind of goes with the French seasonality when they start to use game game stuff when it gets like January when it's very cold. That's when Sinigang comes onto the menu and then when mm -hmm. it's a little bit drier and hotter then that's when a lot of the grilling stuff happens under the menu so it's really a lot of um familiar and comforting dishes but more presented in, in a in a party in a party vibe is, is, what, is what i can call it now before you guys open your restaurant did you do what that first you know what there's a market for it well i'm from argentina and my biggest dream is always to open up a restaurant of course the one thing i wanted to do was promote filipino food um, I actually opened up a restaurant inside my home and it was like the safest way because I wasn't putting a lot of capital down opening up a big fancy restaurant and I opened up, we, there was a concept here that, uh, that started to close to our restaurant and so I opened up my house, I started once a week and I did twice a week and then the restaurant took over my home and that was my way of introducing Filipino cuisine in mm. the four course menu. And I did it more traditional Filipino food because people don't even know it. They didn't even know Filipino food. But they're flavors that Argentines actually like. They don't know it, but they like it. Um, you just have, mm. I just had to bring it to them, present it in a way that they can understand it, present it in, I guess, in a Western way, but still have the Filipino flavor there. Like when I make my kari kari, I don't serve the bubble on the side. I already put it in the sauce. Because if mm. I serve it on the side, I don't think they're going to get it. The banana blossom, also like I cook it and I, I, I the way I, ch I chop it differently, instead of serving like a, a big piece like this, I, I chop it up and I put it inside the sauce. So actually they, when they eat it, they think it's like, um, what do you call it? An alcohol seal, what is it, alcohol seal? Um, or an artichoke or they think it's like seaweed or something and then i tell them it's a banana blossom like wow that's a banana blossom and that's so common for us to eat but for an argentine it's different charles you're not the only filipino restaurant in l.a no 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 not at all not at all i'm probably no? i like to call myself the the second maybe the second generation of restaurants you know what i'm saying where it's like the people my age of the early 30s i'm kidding mid 30 you know like there's a lot of them a lot of them are like uh, the first generation uh filipinos that moved here in the back in the 60s and 70s that opened Turo Turos. so i'm playing so i'm part of that the new wave of filipino restaurants that are trying to trying to make it you know um just like what christina said a while ago it's like a lot of a lot of it just presenting it making your audience eat it you know but you just want to keep remaking what you're making just so they accept it. Even though it's the same thing of the original right. version. You just have to look for that.
proper combination, whether it's the feel of the restaurant, the way it's served. As long as the essence of it is there, then then it's golden, you know. Before Mamster, I had rice bar here in in downtown. You know, it's a little jewel box of of a place, literally like 275 square feet. You know, I ran that for four years, and it was all rice bowls of of everything. I think I had like six menu items, and it's only like seven seats. You know, like you, you just realize that there's so much more to the cuisine that you can offer more than you know the, the six foot stove that, that i that i had so just through the years just writing down this is would be good this would be good but at the same time before opening rice bar when you know i, I was at patina here in la every time i would write tasting menus the the courses that would like get the most feedback would be like the courses that would have a lot of filipino nods to it but just imagine like serving you know, like just serving these dishes in beautiful Bernardo plates, you know, beautiful silver paired with amazing, amazing wine. And, and just the juxtaposition of, of these flavors with with the, with the wine. So, so everybody was always just like, wow, this is really good, you know, this is really good. So I always knew that there was a market for Filipino food, but it's really a lot of trial and error because a lot of the things that we truly, truly love in the Philippines, it just doesn't quite translate here sometimes, you know. So would you say LA, that Filipino cuisine is still underrepresented in LA? Uh, it depends on who you're talking to, you know what I'm saying? Like if you're yeah. talking to the average white American, then yeah, for sure they don't have any idea what it is. But if you're talking to the you know, the, the brown Filipinos, yes they do know, but they they don't know of all the Filipino restaurants. You know what I'm saying? This is very apparent to me. When I meet a Japanese person here, they know exactly where the restaurants are to go to. Whether it's in downtown LA, it's in Torrance, they just know. I feel like their representation and the knowledge of what these restaurants are, why they exist in, in the Filipino aspect is still needs a little bit of work and a little bit of time. You know, but it's not, the people there are pretty open-minded to trying a new cuisine, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, Every, everybody's very adventurous. You get one chance. You know, you get one chance to 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 wow them. Uh, for me, it was a gamble um, because where I am located in Newtown, it's um, almost no Filipino people around you. Um, it's mm -hmm. basically like, you know, your um, Middle Eastern, your Europeans and your, your yeah, white Australians. Um, all the Filipinos are about 45 minutes away from where I am. And so that was the gamble part because, uh, you know, if you're 45 minutes away, you, you may not want to travel here because there's a lot of restaurants, Filipino restaurants out in those areas. Um, and to my surprise, um, yeah, to my surprise, um, people still um, came to my eatery and um, traveled to experience Sibulichon here in Newtown. Yeah. Now, how did you prepare for the opening of your restaurant? Did you go to the Philippines and do research? Did you read through a lot of cookbooks? How did you study for the, for the concept of your restaurant? Um, I already had an idea on what I wanted the restaurant to look like, like aesthetically. I traveled to Cebu probably twice a year, you mm -hmm. know, since like, I don't know, 2002, I've been going twice a year. And um, every time I go back, um, I, I get like inspiration. And so last year when I decided to open, I wanted to um, have that Cebu feel like the aesthetics like with the bamboos and sort of like yeah a lot of bamboo a lot of sort of um natural colors like brown and earthy colors but why why the next one in Cebu uh, I was I was I was born in Cebu I grew up in Cebu okay, until good. I was about 10 and um I love Cebu Lechon and um it's a family favorite um, and I thought, you know what, um, my aunts and my uncles and my cousins, my grandparents, they love it. And if they love it, then there's a possibility that the general public may love it too. So, 
So, Christina, how did you prepare for your restaurant? My living room turns into a restaurant, and then I just do it in my, my bedroom. <laughs> and then my, my, kitchen, my kitchen became an industrial kitchen. But that lasted for about six and a half years. And when we realized that we needed to move to a street restaurant, mm -hmm. we, we, we moved it to Palermo. And I already had my clientele. Um, we were serving, we only could seat about 20, 20 to 25 people in the restaurant in my house. And we were doing 75 people in a night. So we knew that we had a clientele for that. And how did I prepare for it? I, I just made whatever I wanted to make and whatever I liked to eat. And then I presented it and I told them that they had to eat it and <laughs> they liked it. Do you have calamansi in Argentina? No, no. <laughs> I <laughs> wish. <laughs> um, uh, when I want to really get close to lemon, what I do, I um, mix mandarin or orange with lemon or lime, and I add a little bit of sugar. That's how I try to get close to it, as close as possible I can get. We have no color on here. Mm -hmm. Accessibility to, to local ingredients is something that you guys struggle with. Um, what are some of the ingredients that you wish are available in your country? I'm pretty lucky here in LA, you know, it's a, the Central California has a lot of uh, Asian market. almost the same, almost the same climate as, uh, as the Philippines. So a lot of like Laotian farmers, a lot of Filipino farmers actually, so we can get fresh taro, fresh bitter melon, calamansi even, but the calamansi in the Philippines is still superior, you know, um, it's never the same here, but I'm happy. I'm happy with what we can get here. Um, I wish I can get the same seafood as you guys get over there. Um, the different bagels that you guys have over there, but we can't, you know. What Charles said is like pretty spot on. Um, I can get calamansi here, but I think in terms of the quality, um, the, you know, the ones that I've had in Cebu, um, yeah, were much better quality. Um, in here, like they're quite small, the calamansi, whereas over there, it's just yeah, a little bit bigger in size. Um, obviously, more, more, uh, more juice out of it. Um, but you have access to all the ingredients that you need for the bullet one, even the pig, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Like star anise, you know, um, scallions, lemongrass. Ooh, the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> star anise. <laughs> there it so is. What, well. What's the situation in Argentina, Christina? Well, I can, um, Argentina is a really long country, so the north of the country is actually in the tropics. Uh, we don't get coconut, so most of the coconut I get is um, actually from the Philippines. I get coconut, coconut milk from the Philippines. Um, or we get it from Brazil. But the north of Argentina, the ingredients that I get, I get tropical fruit. I get uh, uh, guava. Um, I get lemongrass, I get um, taro, but I can't get the gabi leaves. For some reason, when they harvest, they harvest the, the potato part, but they throw the leaves and they, they don't understand why anybody would use them. So mm -hmm. even though I've asked my provider to bring it to me, um, it's a, actually a, a Laotian community that's living in the north that they produce all of these uh, Asian products. And that I get bananas, banana leaves, banana heart. I get, um, and I think that it's pretty amazing in Argentina because it's actually not a seafood culture. So it's all the seafood is from the, the cold water and super tasty. Mm. It's like that sweet, creamy. The shrimp, the shrimp is red, it's not the blue shrimp. Um, we get that pretty big clams, um, and what else do we get? We ate as uh, scallops. So not the big scallops that you get in, in LA, but they're little, it's super sweet and, and, and beautiful. Um, and you know, it's a peace country, like Australia, we have tons, tons and tons of peace, so. But spices, they come in from Asia, they're imported, so I have no problem with that. But I can't get calamansi. And, and mm -hmm. um, that's super important. And the vinegar, I think there's vinegars that are available here. I mean, they, they don't make vinegars like they do in the Philippines, but I mean, I use what I can find. 
So, and then I create my own Taosawan. Well, I'm sure the Philippine, Filipino communities in your countries and the OFWs are very thankful to you guys for giving them a taste of home. Um, did opening a successful Filipino restaurant abroad give you a sense of pride? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most definitely, you know. Yes. Again, there's it, it's so it's so fitting in today's social climate to to be talking about this. It's like, because there's nothing like your own, you know. Like, I, I've cooked in French kitchens the past fifteen years, and they all have a sense of pride about their that cuisine. Like every French person, you know, is like, oh, this is how you do it, you know. So I knew that at some point I needed to cook Filipino food, and then now that I'm cooking it, it's it's great, you know. And to see the community we've built is pretty satisfying. Dira, Dira. Every Filipino that comes to Argentina, which is very few, they always stop by my restaurant and they have dinner there. Um, I, I would probably have to say that almost every Filipino that lives in Argentina is passed through my restaurant. Um, but it's, it's not like a, but it's not like a turo turo, you know. They they come and they like they come and celebrate their anniversary. It, it, it's it's like a night out, it's a night out. Mm -hmm. um, when, also, when uh, for example, the Filipino embassy when they come, it's always a big celebration. The, a whole big group comes, and so yeah, it, it makes me feel good because they see their food, Filipino food, presented in a very nice way in a very hip, fun environment. Fun music, a big open kitchen. You can see everybody cooking and then enjoying mm -hmm. themselves with really good fine wine and our specialty drinks. Well, you were recently featured in a newspaper feature for promoting Filipino cuisine. How did that feel? Oh, unbelievable. Like, literally unbelievable. Like, we're pinching ourselves then you know, to the point like, is this happening? Like Filipino food is is getting recognized by mainstream Australia, by, you know, by the white white Australian. And um, yeah, I'm still looking at the paper and thinking, wow, it's, it's actually real. Um, so we're very- <laughs> Congratulations. We're, oh, thank you. Um, we're very over the moon about it. And, um, you know, I mean, America um, had, uh, their wave of um, recognizing the Filipino cuisine like how many years ago and in Australia it's just it's just happening so we're like I don't know how many maybe we're like seven eight years behind or ten years behind America um, you know in terms of that recognition from mainstream from the general public yeah so we're very we're so happy and pleased with that with that article um, the good food guide is a big thing it's it's like well, Sydney Morning Herald is your equivalent to like New York Times or LA Times. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they did a full cover story, like a spread about Filipino. And Yasmin did like two pages of Filipino dishes, yeah. viands, like um, recipes. Yeah. So what kind of um, opportunities did you get for being a Filipino cuisine ambassador in the country? You know, it's, um, it's a blessing. Big, it's a blessing because we get to do this. We we, yeah. we get to ex we get to collaborate with a lot of people, a lot of amazing people. But it's also a curse because they expect you to know everything about the cuisine, yes. and they expect you to to cook the way their grandmothers oh, cook. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and they expect you to 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 price it the way they want it priced. You know. Yes. And <laughs> so that's. But again, that that's something that I've. I've accepted a long time ago, being an immigrant here, that there's a certain set of rules that you got to play with to be successful, and you just kind of roll with the punches. And of course, staying true to what you can do. That's that's why it's a curse. But you know, it's more of a, it's definitely a blessing and a great responsibility. A, a but a great responsibility is probably what I need to say is we need to represent it properly. We need to represent it strongly, and we need to support each other. You can't just serve Filipino food and say this is Filipino food because this is how my mother made it. You know, that's not enough. It's a, it's also a business. So you got to make sure that people will come back. It's like, no matter how close you are to that recipe, if it's not being reciprocated, you, you sometimes you got to move on from that recipe. Well, one opportunity that's open up for you is the cookbook, right? You're doing a Filipino cookbook. Yes, I'm, I'm writing a, a, well, I'm writing it. It's already written. It's on the China. It's getting printed. <laughs> Um, 
Last year, I took a trip to the Philippines and it's actually been about five years I've been working on it, but the actual writing of the book and the production of the book, uh, we did, we started last year with a, a team of three photographers. Uh, I have a co-writer and we went to the Philippines for 22 days and we went to 12 different destinations. And we took photos, uh, um, noted recipes. Some recipes are mine, some recipes are borrowed. It's already written in Spanish. It's called Cucinera Filipina. And it'll be all available all over South America, Mexico, and Spain. Do you find it hard to explain to people what Filipino cuisine is? No, no, because I feel it inside. So I, I don't have a hard time explaining it. I, I, exp I explain it through history. Mm. You know, I explain it uh, about the how it was colonized, the immigration from China, um, the more of the indigenous Philippines, Austronesian, the Malays coming in from the from the south, mm. the Indian influence, and that's how I describe it. I describe it through the through history and the influences from all over, and of course, and uh, it's in the middle of the Pacific and it has. 7,000 islands, so you use your native products that you um, you have available there, and that's what the looking up machine is about. With the rice bar in MEMS, there's a lot of sensory overload, you know, like at MEMS, a uh, rice bar, the smell would just permeate outside the restaurant, and they would just like, what is that smell? You know, like the, the smell of Blancanisa cooking on the griddle, the smell of garlic rice cooking, the smell of jasmine rice steaming, you know, so that, and then at MEMS, there's yeah. all the sizzle, all the sizzle platters, you know, so I made sure that less talking and more looking and a lot yeah. of like the vibing and as like I want that, I want that and just the smells, you know, because it's the smells and that energy that that all makes the cuisine so vibrant, you know? Because, you know, truth be told, there's not a whole lot of spices in our in our food. You know, the pantry is not as complicated as as, as a French pantry, as an Italian pantry. You, or even a Thai, especially a Thai or a Vietnamese, you know, it's, it's not as complex. But with the way you prepare the food, the temperatures, and then again, the, the, the smoke, the sizzle, and they just, they just want it, you know? I want that. <laughs> Less talking. I, I want to know your two cents on how some Filipino cuisine hasn't reached the same status as, say, Thai cuisine or Vietnamese cuisine. What's holding us back? I think it just it's just a matter of time, you know. Oh. For example, the Americans were they had the Vietnam War, right? So they had that exposure there, and then the first migration here of oh, the refugees, and so they, they've been here for a long time. Same with the same with Thai food; they've been here for a long time. They've struggled for a long time, and it's only now they're almost like mainstream, you know. So for us, we've I feel like we've been around but it hasn't really per it hasn't really like again like put in mainstream because everybody's like it's almost like back burner food still in terms of like it's mostly turo turos very few uh modern filipino restaurants um i wish there were more, more risk takers out there um but it's just it's just time it's just i, I really feel it's just time and more restaurants more exposure they'll get there the food is definitely amazing. All of us Filipino Australians have really banded together to really introduce and promote, you know, the flavors of the Philippines to mainstream Australia. And um, because of that movement, the traction has just become stronger and stronger. Okay. Well, final word with regard to promoting Filipino cuisine. What can you tell the people out there? What uh, what can they? Expect? when we try Filipino cuisine, or for anyone who hasn't tried it, what can you tell, um, tell them about it? Uh, be ready for a different taste experience. Um, um, you know, definitely, they'll, uh, the sinigang is obviously, they're going to be blown away with the sourness of the broth. Um, for example, with what we do with Cebu Luchon, the, there's a lot of um, punchy, strong umami flavors that, that you get in every bite. Um, you know, with, with our, you know, pinak bet, it's, you know, really infused with crazy over-the-top um, uh, shrimp paste, but your bagoong, 
Um, so the, those are the different flavor profiles that they can expect. Well, I, I feel like Filipino food is um, much more complex. It, it's slow food. You take your time in cooking it and making it. So, and, and flavors are, are layered. So, the experience of somebody eating Filipino food is that you start to taste each level of flavor. Like he was talking about the sourness, the punchiness. Um, those flavors get layered on and you can taste all of that flavor get developed inside the dish and inside your mouth. So it's complexity, that's how I feel. Mm. Um, you think it's simple, for, for example, um, being in a salad, it's like when you, it's, mar it's marinated with, with all these different flavors, right? But it's yeah. simply grilled. And then you dip it in vinegar, the salsawan. So all of these flavors in the achiote or achuete, you have all these different flavors grilled on. You have the marination, the grilling, and the grilling has to be like a, a hard fire, you know? The fire hits it and, you know, it burns it a little bit. So it gives it that scorching. And then the dipping sauce with it. So mm. those are all different flavors that are layered. And, I, and for example, on the Tinidang as well, my my grandmother always told me she's like when you, when you start off as uh, young nice you start off with um, um, you know the ginger searing it so that it starts to, the the sugar start to come out and it's not a spicy flavor and then you throw the fish sauce on it and then fish sauce when the, the the smell goes away the fishiness that's when you can start putting the broth inside so all the flavors are low. Uh, are layered. I think those are very complex techniques of cooking, and I think that's what people will taste inside of the food. That's why it's so delicious. Um, I think it's the food, it's the only food that is truly served with a very unique type of love. You know, it's the, it's the hospitality that we serve the food with and the, 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 the genuine love to take care of the guests. You, you always hear about love for food, Love, love is a secret ingredient. I think that's that's truly true. It truly, truly shines with our cuisine. You know, I was just in the Philippines in November, and we got taken around the country, and just the love and the hospitality that we received. Again, I'm from there. You know, like I've, I've I, I thought I knew that, but being removed from it for a couple of years, and then to see it again. It's almost like, wow, it, it truly is the only cuisine that it's served with so much love. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, that's, I focus on that a lot because it's, it's, it's what makes it truly, truly unique. We really love to take care of everybody. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the most important thing. On that note, I'd like to thank you guys for your time. Salud. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Not from your restaurant and here's the Filipino cuisine. Stay safe.